Welcome to episode three of the Eastside Morales podcast. I'm your host, Rick Garcia Vega. Now, on this episode of the Eastside Morales podcast, we have the good brother, A.G. the coroner. Uh, coroner is gracious to sit down uh, via Skype and talk about what it was like growing up in uh, East New York in the 80s and 90s. Uh, also wanted to talk about how we got into rapping. Um, you know, I'm always curious about how people uh, get their introduction. Uh, we also talked about uh, the late, great Sean Price, you know, uh, coroner knew him well, and I just kind of, you know, wanted to want some insight on that. Um, but in all actuality, we talked about a lot of things. This was the, the longest episode we've had, uh, which is only three, but uh, considering, uh, you know, the other ones were about 50 minutes, uh, 45 minutes or so, we went, stretched this one out to about an hour 15 so uh, it was a great conversation. Um, I welcome this this brother back anytime uh, to do this again because uh, I feel like we've had so much more that we could have talked about. But uh, but for now, you know, take a listen for yourself. Ag the coroner. I'm about to start off by asking you uh, about your name, but I actually caught the uh, that Forbes DVD uh, uh, interview you did. So. Uh, I don't know if things changed in the past uh, year or so. Yeah. When, when was that? Like nah. last year? Yeah, yeah, that was last year. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I did some. I could say this much. I did some work. Okay. Oh, um, I had to do, you know, with dead bodies and all that. So. Okay. Oh, cause, that's cause, cause that I mean I, I I I mean the rumor. I'm not gonna say rumor because I I, I don't even know where I heard it from. But uh, I heard that, that you were actual coroner, so I don't know if that was true or not. That, that could be true. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to. I'm just curious. You know what I'm saying? But the, is the AG stand for anything, or is that? Uh... Uh, AG. When I first when I first started spitting back in um, when I first started spitting seriously back in like '96, my my name they they used to call me Agony. Okay. That was my original name. Cause every, I, was, I used to write rhymes about painful shit and, and going through struggle and trials and tribulations and all that. So um, that's how I got that name. And then they just they cut it short to um, AG after that. And then from AG, it just became AG. Okay. And that shit stuck. So I was AG for a long time until the outdoors came together. And then that's when they christened me with the coroner thing. So you coroner, coronelli, you know, everything, yeah. huh? Okay, so let's let us let us get into um, let's get into the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, uh, I know you've done interviews, so this is a lot of this stuff is not uh, um, it's already out there. You know what I'm saying? But um, you grew up in uh in East New York, right? Yeah, that's correct. East New York, born 1977, born and raised, man. Now, uh, East New York is infamous. You know, uh, for people that I, I guess. <laughs> Familiar or unfamiliar, but uh, during the 80s and, and, and the 90s, the, it, it, things, was, things were a lot different, you know, just uh, in, in the world, I would say. But New York was a lot different, you know, uh, before Giuliani came around. So um, kind of bring, bring, bring me back and kind of just give me a view because I'm not from East New York. I've never lived in East New York, so I don't know what, it, what it's like. So if I can get a better... Uh, idea of what it was to to actually grow up and live there at that time oh man it was a gift and a curse man it was it, it was beautiful and ugly at the same time you know you don't notice until you step out of that box and you move away and you come back and you're like damn I like i i used to live here that's crazy but um it, it was i mean the whole new york was bad like don't get me wrong like new york was just fucked up mm -hmm. But um, the the two neighborhoods that I could compare closely were East New York and probably the entire Bronx at the time was was kind of like East New York was a smaller version of the BX. Okay. Um, it was it was murder, murder, drugs, drugs. I mean, that's all it was. That's all that it was. I mean, you know, you you couldn't stay inside, so you had to be a kid. You know, I was a kid at the time, so you know, you had to go outside and and and, and get up with your boys and play little sports but you, you know there was all these things going on around you at the same time that was just it was it was unreal like the, the closest 
the best example I could give if somebody wanted to actually like see it and maybe know a little bit about, you know, what it was really like. There was a movie that came out with Charles Bronson called Death Wish Three. Oh, shit. All right. If you're familiar with the Death Wish uh, series, part three was filmed actually right on my block and all around East New York. And they didn't change anything, man. They 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 used there was no sets. They used everything as is, and if you just look at what it looked like, you could imagine what it what it was like. Kind of like reality like, TV, huh? <laughs> yeah, it looked like a war zone. It looked like a war zone. Every block, you know, maybe maybe you had one or two houses or buildings standing up. The rest was just like rubble and uh, you know rocks, uh, crack vials, needles, uh, dirty diapers, like. Shit all over the floor. It just looked like a bomb hit it, man. So what's it look like now? Now nah, it, it doesn't look so bad. They fixing it up. Um, you know, it's becoming gentrified. It's, yeah, I was gonna in one ask. Of the last, in one of the last areas is uh, Brownsville and East New York are the last two that they're gonna hit up. They haven't. I don't think they touched the Bronx yet. But um, that's gonna be tough to tackle the Bronx. But uh, because of transportation, right? Yeah. Just the, this is so big, and yeah. there's so many people, and it, you, you know, to get that amount of people out of there is it's just gonna take a, a while. It'll probably take another ten years before they get, before they clean the Bronx out. Hmm. But um, Brownsville and East New York were the last two on the hit list for Brooklyn, and it looks like that's gonna be, you know, going down within the next year or two. Wow. It's nice over there. They're bringing, you know, they changing. I go over there from time to time, and they got all kinds of new restaurants, and you know, the, they moving people out of the projects. Get ready to move the, the middle class in. So I'm just I want to know where these people are going. That's what yeah, I, I mean that's what I'm wor- I'm wondering. You know, like uh, that that's been the um, but the, but gentrification that's it's happening all around the country though. Um, it's I, I live in San Antonio, Texas. I'm actually from Massachusetts, but um, I, I moved out here uh, like in '01. Um, but uh, I noticed it out here. You know, I noticed. Um, some of the slummer areas, you know, they, they, uh, you just started seeing the for sale signs and, uh, then you started seeing some high rises get built and then you started seeing a lot of nicer things and then you saw bicycles, you know what I'm saying? It's like, Hey, where did this stuff come from? You know what I mean? But little did I know that, uh, the same thing was happening in Brooklyn because, uh, my, my family is from New York. So, uh, they just, we just migrated to Massachusetts, you know, when, um, when I was about six years old. But um, I I I spent that's where I spent the first six years of my life. But that's I mean that's neither here nor there. But the the idea of it transitioning to something like that was kind of crazy for me because you've always known, especially in the '80s, um, it, it was Brooklyn was grimy. You know what I'm saying? I mean not the whole Brooklyn because I can't speak for the whole Brooklyn, but from uh, from what where I've been, you know, um, and what it's known for. That's what you, uh, especially in, in hip hop music, you know what I'm saying? You hear Brooklyn, you hear Biggie, you know what I'm saying? You hear, you hear Hove. Yeah, the style was good, you know. They they had their time. Uh, the Ville, obviously Brownsville, East New York, were like we always, as, as much as we hate to admit it, you know, it's it's one neighborhood really. Yeah. Brownsville, East New York. If you say you from Brownsville, you from East New York, and, and vice versa. Because you know, they're because they're like right next and, to each and, other, right? Yeah, they connected. It's the same shit, the same people. Everybody's family. Like if you live in East New York, you definitely have family that live in Brownsville. Okay. And you know the other way around too. But for the first time, maybe like maybe like five years ago, uh, I was I was talking to Sean Price, God rest his soul. Yeah. And you know he's from the Ville. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm I'm in the crib and he he's telling me he's like yo man, because I mean Sean was one of the worst. And he, you know, he he was in the streets heavy in the Ville. And he's like, man, you said the only place we were scared to go was to East New York. Yeah. And he he would come. He would go in there. But I'm like, damn, like we thinking the opposite. Like in the East, we thinking like, damn, we don't really want to go to the Ville. But it turns out dudes in the Ville didn't really want to come into our neighborhood neither. And that's that's crazy because all these niggas was killing. Hmm. Yeah, because I know I, I I've heard on uh like re- as far as recently um. You know, on, on Nori's podcast, when he's talking about um, when he was locked up, he's, anybody he met from East New York had a body, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I guess the, the reputation uh, uh, surpasses itself, you know. Um, but let, let's talk Let's talk about um, 
the the music a little bit. Like you said you started rapping in '96. Yeah, man. So how did that was, how did that start for you? I'll tell you how that transitioned. I was on first of all, I was I, I was a hip hop fan since like I became hip hop fan about 80, 86, 87. Okay. And I wasn't really really that they didn't play that in my house too much. My uncle, my uncle who was um doing a bit at the time, was the big hip hop head. But he was he was bidding out, so he wasn't in the crib. Yeah. So my crib, I got my parents. You know, I might you might go to grandma's house. They playing all kinds of salsa, merengue, old school shit, soul music. You know, then the um, you know what they call Puerto Rican music, freestyle music. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't get you know I had to really go out and search to get my hip hop. And um, the first the first record, the first hip hop record that I ever heard was the show from Dougie Fresh and um, Slick Rick. It's my favorite hip hop record to this day, but the first album I ever owned was the uh, the DOC. Mm. Who's from Dallas? Who's from Dallas? And yeah, yeah. Transplanted over to LA, and uh, so I I, I kind of fell for West Coast hip hop before I even paid attention to what was going on on my side. On my side, wow, so that's from DOC. Hmm. From DOC, my my interest turned towards NWA. And then from NWA to Cube, and from Cube to Cyprus, and so forth. And then I started like, well, what's going on in my town? And that's when I got put onto the Kings and the G Raps. Wow, that's and, interesting. That's that I would have never expected that. I would have never. I mean, I know, I know that uh, that that Death Row, uh, that West Coast invasion was big, but I wouldn't expect, you know, you living in the bed of of. The, the Mecca, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you, you like, looked yeah, over was, the fence, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was the only kid in East New York. And, you know, we all had the boom boxes. So yeah. I would walk around my boom box, so I would bring it out. every. This was an everyday ritual. Come outside with the boom box, sit it next to me on my steps, on my front, you know, my front steps, and just blast all the way up. Turn all the volume up, and I, I had my NWA hat, black with the red letters, and I was blasting you know, his album called Niggas for Life. Yeah. In, in East New York, where, you know, they're not really listening to that. But I made the block fall in love with NWA. And then it just kind of spread like wildfire. So, you know, I'm going to take some credit for that shit. Yeah. I kind of made, made NWA hot in Brooklyn no. <laughs> at, at, at 12 years old. But to answer the, you know, the original question, I started out as just, a, you know, a fan. And then when, when I, but I, you know, I was good at memorizing lyrics. That was one thing I was always good at, but I still never thought about rapping. But I became good with words because of listening to all, all these lyrics. When I got to high school, you know, I tried to be, you know, smooth daddy. And I started writing poetry for, for, for girls. You know, girls like poetry, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to bag chicks. So, um, that, that evolved into writing rhymes. So were you not? Uh, did you? Were you not involved in any uh, any of the other elements of hip hop? It was just uh, straight rap. It was straight rap. You know, but I, I I used to think that I could dance a little bit back then, mm-hmm. like break dancing and shit. I was I was an athletic kid, so I was pretty good at emulating all the you know the steps. Watch Scoop and Scrap Love of Dancing for um Kane. Everybody had dancers back then. All the hip hop um. Most, most hip hop acts had dancers back then. Yeah. So, you know, I was big into third base, third base, MC Search dancing his ass off, Heavy mm-hmm. D dancing, Chub Rock dancing. So um, I was pretty good at emulating that shit, but I never really took it serious, the dance moves. I was never a graffiti dude. Um, I went, I went straight, straight for the jugular, man, right into the lyrics. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. A lot of people find their way into rap, you know, uh, through the other elements, you know, especially, uh, I mean, you 77, I was born in 80, so we kind of, you know, we're in the same age bracket, I would say, and so a lot of us got to see all the elements uh, develop, you know what I'm saying, so to, to go straight into rap, that that uh, that was always the, the intimidating thing, I guess, so you went straight for the jugular. Yeah, there was dudes I went to high school with that rap, but I was never like, I didn't even think about it at the time. I was still doing my little poetry thing. But I used to listen to that shit and be like, yo, these dudes are hell. And then finally, you know, one day I'm like, 
I keep memorizing, memorizing all of these songs, all these lyrics, and I almost sound identical to the dudes that are performing these songs. Like I'm, I'm mastering the performance part of other people's songs so well. Why don't I just write my own shit? Yeah. And that, that's how I just kind of flip. Sitting in the crib one day, call my man over, my man Doob and shit. We were part of a group in the, in the beginning. I, I say, yo, I locked him in my room. I say, you gonna write a rhyme? He's like, what? I say, yeah, nigga, you gonna rap. I'm gonna rap, you gonna rap. He said, nah, I don't wanna do that. I locked the door on him. I said, you're not coming out of the room until you write a rap. Nigga wrote 16 bars, I wrote 16, and from there, it just it blossomed. So why did you this, Why did you uh, want him to rap with you? What, what made you want him to rap with you? I was in the crib bored, man. <laughs> and, you know, these are the homies. These niggas come over to the crib. Or, you know, every day I say, you know, I'm not going to be the only one doing yeah, this. Yeah, I'm not going to do this by myself. Y'all going to do this yeah. too. <laughs> We get a couple of the homies, so I got him and, you know, my man Doob and my, and my brother Chess, who later on went to, you know, buy t- two turntables and a mic, and we started, that's how we started in his room, you know, on tape. So you throw the record on, the instrumental, and when you when you hit record, you better not mess up because you got to rewind the whole tape. So, so know, and especially if you was the last dude, the pressure was on you because the first two dudes got their shit right. And now yeah. you the last verse. If you mess up, they got to do theirs over. So would you purposely uh, go place yourself in, in, in any spot or to, to put the pressure on anybody or would you or put the pressure on yourself? I run it out. You know, I was last all the time. All the time. I always okay. went last. Yeah. I always went last, but I, I had the master not messing up, you know, and um, for a while there in the beginning, once we transitioned from two turntables and a mic into the studio, they gave me the nickname One Take. Oh, cause you knocked because knocked it out. I could knock the shit out in one take. You're like, yo, you don't want to do it again. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. It's good. You know, usually you run through your verse a couple of times. Nah, this doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound right. But we we were on that on that microphone for so long that you know I, I stood with that mentality. So I took it into the booth for me at the same time. Now if I get in, I'm not like that anymore. I, I might mess up a few times. Yeah. It might it might take me six, seven, eight times to get it right. You know, but back then, fresh out of the um, fresh out of the bedroom on on those turntables, we were knocking verses out in the studio, one shot. So where did you uh, where did you what did you do with it? Like when, once you started recording, like where'd you go from there? You just uh, listened to you you just listened to just you and your homies, or did you really start taking it yeah. serious to try to pursue it? We were making tapes. So, you know, and, and I still have some of those tapes to this day. Hmm. These are tapes from like 96, 97, all the way to like 99. And then I think at that point we had transitioned into the um, into the actual studio. Okay. But, um, it was just for our own listening pleasure. Hmm. You know, any song that we liked, my brother went out, he bought two, re- uh, you know, two copies of every record. Make sure the instrumentals were on there and we would just make a whole tape. And then that, you know, word started getting out. We started making copies of the tape for other people in the neighborhood. And now, you know, we find out that there's this whole little world out there in the neighborhood of other dudes who spit. Yeah. And now they want to battle us. So we went through the battle circuit in the hood, which that was a whole different, you know. We hit that before we actually hit the studio. That's how you sharpen your skills, right? Yeah. So who's uh? So who who are some of the um the more well known uh? Rappers from East New York. Shit, well, the first one that I knew of was Prince Marky D from um, Fat Boys. Fat Boys, yeah. Yeah. And then um, after that, it was J. Rue. J. Rue, yeah. From the, when the East when is the, in the house, yeah, yeah. It, the whole Gangstar Foundation really was, uh, um, you know, East New York based. Little Dap, Malachi, the Nutcracker. Um, you know, we had two transplants. We had... Um, we had Guru, who came from up top, around, you know, where, where you from. Yeah. And uh, we had Primo. Where I'm at. From, <laughs> from where I'm at right now, yeah. But that's ill. It's kind of ill. No yeah. thought about that. Um, but they, you know, for us, they're East New York, even if they were born in other places, because musically, they created, I think, a sound. Yeah, they did. They did. Neighbor. You know, and um, that whole Gangsta Foundation was just... And then you have Blase, 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 my man okay. PF, and you know my man Out Loud. Uh, now today, Uncle Murder, mm-hmm. you know, 
And some people will say me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you looking good out here, man. You know, but seeing those dudes do it was, that was an inspiration, you know, because I'm like, I watched them. I watched them from a youngin. You know, I used to sit in and speak to Guru, you know, a lot. He used to babysit. His girl used to babysit my cousin's daughter. So he would drop off the baby and then, well, he would drop off his girl to babysit and then he would hang out with us for a little while. So I got to chop it up with him. And then, uh, you know, years down the line now, J. Rue's my man. You know, PF is family. Out Loud is family. You know, it's always love when I see murder. So, but that's about it, man. You know, I far as people who pop from the neighborhood not too many well that this is a good transition because one thing i like i know you as being uh an mc first and foremost you know what i'm saying but you are also in my opinion you like a social media personality as well you know what i'm saying uh but you yeah. but something i've always been fascinated by is just like you seem to know everybody you know what i'm saying like you post these pictures where you you popping up at these events and I'm like, yo, this guy knows everybody, you know what I'm saying? So that's, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Like how, is it, is it just being in the scene, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and just running into these places. Um, I mean, obviously you gotta be a stand up dude to, to have these type of relationships. But, um, I mean, I, I see you all over the place, man. You know what I'm saying? So kind of explain what that's about. That was just from being in the mix, man, for a long time. That's like 20 years worth of, of hanging out and putting my face out there, even before I started, you know, taking the music seriously. Yeah. I built, you know, just, just being around, going to shows, you know, back in the days, going to the clubs back in the days, people performing there, you know, they just, they, they see you constantly, whether it's going on, wherever that hip hop was at, that, you know, we were there, mm -hmm. you know, me, me and my little crew, you know, so. You know, from Latin quarters to club speed to uh, the tunnel. You know what I mean? So throughout those, you know, throughout those travels, you, you know, little by little, you get to know people and they get to remember your face. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, shit. Like, I've been seeing this dude for years and I didn't even know you rap. Yeah. I've never told nobody that. I never, I never stepped to any of those artists, any of the producers, never told anybody what I did, never asked for, you know, can you put me on, nothing like that. And I think now that that kind of relationship paid off for me because years later I put my album together and not one person who was featured on the album asked me for any money. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were like, when I questioned, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an inquisitive guy, so... I always question things, and um, you know, I asked every single one of them, like, "Yo, what for?" You know, and not that it's a bad thing, but I would like to know why you didn't charge me. And they just say, "Cause you never asked me for nothing. You've been around all these years. You could have told me this. You could have told me that. You could, you know, yank that at that at my shoestrings and 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 ask me to put you on, and you never did that. I had to find find out on my own what you." what you did and I respect that because you grinded you got our attention by just doing your own thing and that shit paid off man I, I, I don't think I did it purposely yeah you know I was just I just never been one to really ask people for anything yeah well it seems to seem to work out for you you know what I'm saying because you know you pretty uh I mean I'm not sure if um popularity matters to you or not you know what i'm saying but you seem to be somebody of uh of respect and uh and influence you know in the hip-hop culture you know what i'm saying the culture that we uh the level of the culture that we that we both appreciate you know what i'm saying um let's let's talk about um about nez man that seems to be one of your, your right hands right there man so how did that uh link up that's my brother right there, man. Nez, Nez put a, a lot of a lot of work in his game too, man, for a long time. Just as longer than me, I'ma say. You know, he was born into the culture. You know, his parents were um, jazz musicians. His mom was a jazz singer. Oh, okay. His father, you know, played the horn, um, and and they played with the greats. 
from like Duke Ellington to like his his godfather Gary Barts, who was like a a legend in the jazz world. And uh, now his his brother in law, Ness's brother, is a, you know a Grammy award winning producer, Omar's Keys. So it's in the bloodline, and um, you know early on in Nez in Nez's uh hip hop experience, he he put in a lot of work with Russell Russell Simmons at mm. Def Jam, and he made a lot of relationships through that, and he always was a spitter, and I feel like that time had come and and gone for him. By the time we met, you know, and at the time that we met, my name was kind of, it was getting out there, it was buzzing. So when we got a chance to build, we met at a, a video shoot, my man Nutso was shooting mm-hmm. a video in uh, Flushing Meadow Park in Queen. So, I, you know, I ran into Nez there and, and I knew he was familiar. So we introduced ourselves and we stood in contact. And from there, I got to learn about his history, he learned about mine. And I felt like, you know, we could help each other. I could help you to get that that position back or that buzz back that you had, and you could help me with your relationships. You know, because he has a lot of relationships that, that I, you know, people that I can't touch. Yeah, yeah. You know, and vice versa. So from then on, you know, that was about five, maybe four or five years ago. And ever since, man, it's been just family, you know. And now we're working together on a lot of things trying to put on, you know, these newer young artists doing some A&R work here and there, so that's, and, uh, that's the homie. Can you say any of the uh, the newer artists' names that, you, that you're that you working with? Well, um, on my side, I, I, I can't, I don't really want to say any names on my side yet because I haven't really done anything for them. Yeah, yeah. But I am, but I am working to do something for them, but Nez just got, um, I don't know if y'all familiar with Bambino, kid from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Neek Bucks, who's from Harlem. Yeah, I've he just got Buck. both of those artists. He just oh, got both of those artists signed to a major deal. Oh wow! Okay. So, um, you know, I'm gonna be working with him closely with those two, and then we got some other things in the, you know, in the fold. A couple of R&B singers, you know. You know, we both have great ears for music, so hopefully the talent that that we find out there, we can um, help them reach that next level. Yeah, you seem like somebody who would prefers to play the background, you know what I'm saying? As as much as you uh as much as you out there, you know what I'm saying, like move, maneuvering through these circles, you know, you seem like a person that keeps things close to the chest, you know what I'm saying? And and uh wants to keep people uh guessing what your move is gonna be instead of like blasting what you're gonna do, you know what I'm saying? I definitely do, man. Like a a lot a lot of me being on front street, it just has to do with a necessity, like it's just certain things that you have to do in order to keep yourself in the fold. Absolutely. But, um, I, I was never into the attention or the, like, it's still weird for me to walk down the street and have people approach me until I got the album. Like, I was just at Main Source event, uh, the reunion last night. And, you know, those were a lot of my peers, and I was a fan of a lot of the dudes that were in the building. And come to find out at the end of the night, while we're all leaving the venue, all these dudes who I grew up on, are coming to me like yo i got your album they naming songs they taking pictures and i'm like this is crazy like it's crazy that you know the people that you that you grew up on and looked up to they they become your fans now yeah yeah they're your peers man they respect it because you put in the work you know what i'm saying you out there you you living your truth right it's just like yeah but just, and just like my man tone said you know ghost my man ghost face he's like the, the respect and the admiration from your peers I mean, that that's pretty much, I think, what you do this for when you're, you know, a purist like we are. But we could do without the fame. Yeah. Like, that mm-hmm. shit is just, you know, that's when it gets funny and relationships change and, and people, you know, do start acting crazy. Man. And I, I don't want no parts of that. Yeah, ego, ego is po- a powerful drug, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, some people invite it and some people shun it you know what i'm saying some people embrace it and you know it is what it is you still got to be yourself right i've never met any artist personally that have given me the you know the cold shoulder or, or the hollywood attitude but i've seen dudes you know go from nothing to a little buzz into something and then their whole attitude changes mm-hmm. and i've seen them do that with other people you can't treat me like that because i mean we could you know 
we could just start I start throwing some smacks around, but yeah, yeah, you know. But it, it's just crazy, man. I, I hate seeing that. I hate seeing that. Well, it's not uncommon, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, I'm sure it's things that you've uh, come across over your years and, no, and knowing a lot of people. But, I mean, yeah. it's just, I, it's numbers, you know. For me, it's like a numbers thing, you know what I'm saying? It's like you're going to run into those type of people the more the more people you meet, the more people you're around. But um, it be detrimental to your career, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you may be the, you can be the most talented artist in the world, but without having a fan to support you, you're nothing. Yeah, absolutely, so absolutely, yeah. You have, you have to treat these people with respect, and not only because you want to sell them your product, but because just being a good dude and a human being, you gotta, you know, you should treat anybody like that, regardless of who you are. You're an artist, you're a doctor, you're a garbage man. You know, treat the next man with respect. But it seems like if you reach a certain stardom, like, I it, I, I feel like we, I, I don't know if it's just the time we're living in, but it just seems like People don't give a shit no more, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not talking about the artist, I'm talking about the fan, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can, an artist can probably treat somebody like shit, talk shit to them, or whatever the case may be, and they're just going to take it and laugh and, and, and enjoy it, you know what I'm saying? Which seems kind of strange to me, but um, I don't know if, I don't know if you've witnessed thing, anything like that. I, but I, I, I've witnessed that definitely, but I, you know, from my observation, I would say the people that kind of take it that way, are more so groupies than fans. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's what yeah, it like is. The, die, the diehards are gonna they, they're gonna feel insulted. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the dudes that just wanna ride your you know, your wave and, and pose with, take pictures in the club with dudes, they just they eat any shit you give them. You know I mean? Well let me ask you this. Uh have you ever met any artist that you were a fan of that was like an asshole, you know what I'm saying? Like and you're like, Man, I can't even fuck with this guy no more, you know what I'm saying? I've never been through that. Oh, okay. Never been that. Thankfully, man, because I'm not. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not the only dude that's 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 built a certain way. But I don't. I don't. I don't do well with that. Yeah. So if you if you if you come across a certain way to me, like we might be fighting like five seconds after. But I, but you could probably give credit to um to just your history of being uh just being around so much. They probably already know not to fuck with you. You know what I'm saying? I already know how to. That to approach you a certain way or not approach you at all, you know what I'm saying? I think maybe I earned that from you know like I like we spoke before the way I came up and building those relationships and not really being around people but not getting too close to them, mm -hmm. you know, keeping that distance so you're not too comfortable. But um, you know, a lot of my friends who were in the industry they dealt with that kind of shit. Lord Nas can tell you better. Than, I mean, he's had two of the top dudes in the game. I mean, and I'm talking, when I say top dudes, I mean, when they say who's the top three all time, those kind of dudes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they've given him that kind of weird Hollywood treatment. You know, and, and he's like me, like, he's he ready to pop off on you if, if you act funny with him. But, he, you know, he just ate that and said, all right, well, you know, but never again, never show that love again. Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's happened to me before, you know. Uh, you know, um, I've 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 had it directly happen to me, and I've had it, and I've seen it from afar, you know what I'm saying? And I just can't I can't listen to the artist the same, you know. And I'm speaking strictly as a fan, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's just it's not the same for me anymore, you know what I'm saying? I've seen some artists play themselves in public, and it, it, like people I looked up to, they're still in the game, you know what I'm saying? But I've seen them in public doing shit that I. Like, you know, as a fan, like, I would never imagine them doing it. And it's like, man, dude, I can't even fuck with I can't even look up to this dude no more. You know what I mean? Not to not to be like, oh, I look up to another man, you know what I'm saying? But just as the artist, uh, you know, the, the body of work that they put out and um, the influence of the music that it had on me. And then I see their, their actual person, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, man, you know. Yeah. They, that's you know. a shame. That's, that's a damn shame, man. But it happens, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm like, fuck yeah. it, you know what I'm saying? I'll move on, you know? But uh, I, I take everything with a grain of salt, too. I don't blame, like, it's, it's real. You got to be real particular with, you know, the things that you see people do. Because, you know, in, in the same light, I've, I've turned around and seen people that they're so f famous where they constantly have people coming at them. And, and they, you know, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. 
So you might catch them on a bad day. Yeah, no, I definitely take that into perspective. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They may, they may act out of character, and then you know you never seen this before. You never met this person, so this is the only, this is the first and only impression that you that you get. And now you know you you like damn this, but this this nigga's an asshole. Like, but you might meet him three months down the line somewhere else, and he's you know the, the nicest dude in the world. So that's true. And that's true. And, and and I kind of like I've seen. Uh, you know, I've seen dudes, you know, coming off tour or being on tour, and uh, and having conversations and having that vibe. And and at the time, I di I didn't understand, you know what I'm saying? But you have to understand that these guys probably they've been on the road, you know what I'm saying? And they're out of their element, and they and then now they got to do some other shit. Now they want now they need to talk to you, you know what I'm saying? Because I I was doing interview type shit back in the days. Um, I had a, 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 you know, like a little public access show and, um, you know, I, I set up an interview with an artist, you know what I'm saying? And, and this dude was totally like disconnected and attitude and, and it was just like, and, but the, you know, it was a group, it was two, two of the guys and, and, you know, one was cool and one was just being an asshole. And I was like, man, fuck this guy, you know what I'm saying? But then on the flip hand side, I've interviewed, um, you know, somebody who's had more stature than, than a guy like this, you know what I'm saying? And I, I'll tell you like this. I met Rakim. I interviewed Rakim. And if Rakim can take time out and be gracious enough to chop it up with me, then nobody else should have an attitude, you know what I'm saying? And that's how I saw it. But I, I, I can understand everybody has a different personality. But don't tell me you that you that you bigger than Rakim in my eyes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> It took me a long time to understand that, man, like the, you know, little intricate things like that. Because even on a smaller scale, I'm I'm nobody that's big or, or super famous, but I've been on the road before, mm -hmm. traveling, back-to-back -back shows, no sleep, mm -hmm. starving. And then, you know, you might it might be that one time where somebody's being a little bit overzealous. Yo, you only need a picture. You only need a picture. You only need yeah. a picture. All right, give me a second, homie. Yo, 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 nah, let me get a picture now. And then all of a sudden, it turns into something. Mm -hmm. And now you got to think about it, because I've thought about it before. Then I'm about to be an ass real quick. Let me stop myself. Yeah. You know, that's just not my character. So even if somebody's being a little bit overzealous, I'm still that dude to stand up and say, "Yo, just you know what, homie, just chill. I got you. Yeah. Just chill." Yeah, yeah, and, and and that's understandable. And, and and when somebody's being overzealous, I understand that. But I mean, I like I like you know, just like you said, sometimes you catch people at the wrong time, you know, and, and things like that. So I would chalk I would chalk some of that stuff up to that. But then some of the times, you know, I, I seen people just playing themselves, you know, what I'm saying drunk yeah. out the face, you know, what I'm saying or whatever the case may be, and and it's just like, man, you need to, you know, and and that's not even me interacting with them. That's just me observing from afar. But um, besides all that shit, you know, what I'm saying let's. Let's talk about Sean Price, man. Uh, he's definitely, like, um, still to, to this day, one of my favorite rappers, you know what I'm saying? Um, after his unfortunate passing, I'll tell you what, I listened to him for a year straight, you know what I'm saying? Like, every single day I was listening to Sean Price. And I understand that, you know, you guys were, uh, you guys had a, a relationship, you know what I'm saying, a friendship, kinship. Um, I mean, I'd like to hear, you know, from your perspective, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, how, how'd you guys connect and, and what formed the bond between you guys, you know? Man, that's crazy that you that you say, you know, you listen to him for like a year straight afterwards because I couldn't listen to him after that happened for a long time. Um, me, and Sean, me and Sean knew each other by face on the street for a long time. He would always come to, uh, he would come through the neighborhood to the east <laughs> to get his bud, mm -hmm. you know? I'm sure it wasn't the only place, but he would come. He would come through a lot. So it was always the head nod thing in the beginning. This is when he was still slim, Sean. He okay. hadn't even gained the weight yet. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, a, a lot of time went by, and I, I honestly, I, I never went to like a lot of boot camp uh, performances or shows. It just so happened that um, a friend of mine was, I think, shooting a video in a city somewhere. And uh, I, I spoke to my man PF, and PF was working with him. You know, they they were like brothers. And PF said, you know, Sean's in the, in the city doing a video too. Why don't you stop by? So Sean wound up hitting me directly. 
he called my phone and he's like, yo, this is Sean Price. And I'm like, nah, I'm getting prank called right now. It's like, nah, this is, this is Sean. And I'm gonna put you in the video, come through. So I'm like, oh shit, all right. And I, and I came through and um, I forget what song it was. It was a remix for some song. And I'm thinking I'm walking into, you know, the average hip hop video. You got all, you know, dudes from the hood around and maybe a couple of chicks and some weed in the air, some forties, but when I got there, it was a bunch of crazy looking white boys and they were doing like a mosh pit. Hmm. This is a monkey bars at the time? You know what? The name of the song, it was it was a little bit after Monkey Bars. The name of the song okay. was How the Guards Chill. Okay. I think that later on he did a remix with, uh, it was him, Rock, and Mayhem did a remix to that song. Okay. But this was for the original song with just him on it. So I walk into this and I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm, I don't know if we're in the right place. And here comes Sean out of left field. Like, you know, now you here, yo, corner was good. Uh, you know, chill out for a little while. If you want to be in the video, you can get. I said, no, nah, I don't want to be in this. Because these dudes were just beating each other out. Like, I, I've seen mosh pits on television, but never in person like that. Yeah. But, you know, blood all over the place, uh, place, teeth flying, dudes breaking their ankles and kneecaps. And this was the video shoot? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I just played the cut, you know, and, and I waited till he was done. And when we built afterwards, and uh, I think me and Sean formed such a close bond because in a lot of ways we were alike. You know, smart aleck, intelligent uh, pranksters, dudes that like to joke a lot, make people laugh, witty, you know, yeah. slick, like quick, quick tongue. So, you know, it was more that it wasn't really about, yo, let's get in and, and, and get these joints together, son. And, you know, he would just call me and, and I pick up my phone. And he just start rapping. Just not even hello, just right into a verse. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? He'd be like, yo, you think that shit was hot? I'm like, yo, you asking me? What you gonna do if I say no? Shit was wacky. You gonna erase it and 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 write it again? And he start laughing. But you know, he, he was always like that. He he didn't have to do that, but he would run the verses by me. I'm sure I wasn't the only one he would do that to. Yeah. You know, and um, but we we built. You know, our our, our build and our relationship was based a lot more more personal than it was music. And um, you know, that's that's why I held I held him so close. You know, to my heart. It's just still, you know, to this day, it's still, like, mind-blowing. I, sometimes I still don't believe he's, he's not here. Yeah, because you guys went to um, Knicks games together, too, right? Yeah, we, we actually went to a Nets game. A uh, Nets game, okay. We went, we went to a Nets game, both wearing Knicks. Knicks, like, okay, that's what it was then, yeah. yeah. People were screaming stuff at us. Like, it was crazy, man. Like, it, it was funny, too, because, like, we, we went to the concession stand to go get some uh, some sodas. I be mean, walking back, and these dudes just screaming, you know, they're talking mad shit behind us. And we just walking down the steps, and both of us turn around at the same time and just look at the dude. And he's like, no, no, no. He put his hands up like, nah, no problem. Uh, <laughs> my bad, my bad, my bad. So they were, the Nets weren't even playing the Knicks? Y'all just went in there went to the game wearing Knicks apparel? It's my, my man Black Irish and shit. <laughs> and the dude that raps and shit, my man Black Irish. He had a... Uh, had some tickets and you know he called me and Sean like yo come through it was the Nets versus the Celtics okay uh, yeah, we had a good time man that was that was a real good, one of the few good times you know that that, that we had Remember yeah the, like yeah like Sean, Sean Price was um he was just one of them uh them rappers that was just like uh, that I always respected because if he was fucked up he let you know he was fucked up if shit was yeah. good, he let you know it was good. It was like he, it, there was no front to him. You know what I'm saying? Of course, he's going to have his bars about, you know, busting shots or whatever the case may be or doing this and that. But he was talking reality shit. You know what I'm saying? Like he was telling you his life. And um, and I always respected that because he never fronted. You know what I'm saying? And that was just like, that's, you know, that's not a common trait, you know, to put your whole life on it, especially somebody um, of Sean Price's caliber, you know, you know. That's that's how I that's that's one aside from him just being a lyrical beast, you know what I'm saying? That was one of the real things that connected for me as a fan. Um That was his that was his thing, Sean was like the you know, what he wanted to get across to his fans was I'm just a regular dude mm -hmm. who knows how to rap. So when you went to a Sean Price show, 
he didn't make you feel like he was above you. He made you feel like like he was in the crowd and maybe he just got on stage and started rapping. Yeah, yeah. yeah he sounded good. You know, blue blue average, collar rapper. Blue collar Joe, a, a average, yeah. average Joe. Yeah. And then and, and people appreciated that, you know. And you don't see that too much. And I guess that's how he built his cult following. Because I'm not gonna lie, in the beginning, I was always a big Helter Skelter fan, but I was I was a rock fan before I was a rock fan. Okay. You know, I was near. Rock was that dude. I'm like, Yo, this dude's one of the illest. And then and then I like Sean after him. And then Sean kind of reinvented himself. He did. You know. And then he just became like the punchline king. I'm like, yo, this dude is sick. Then he became my favorite afterwards. And carried that flag for Duck Down, too. And it's funny how you mentioned, um, and you hear that a lot. You know, I've heard, I hear a lot of um, stories about him as far as, you know, picking up the phone, calling people, rapping, uh, just spitting bars, you know, and just hang up or whatever the case may be. And um, I, I, um, they, uh, they had, uh, Duck Down had their 15th anniversary out here, um, you know, five, six years ago, whatever the kid, whatever year it was. Um, so I, I've, I've done some work with, um, some duck down in the past. And so, um, I picked these guys up at the airport and Sean Price was, you know, he happened to be riding with me. And so he's in the back seat, you know what I'm saying? Rapping the whole time, saying some wild shit though. Like I can't even repeat, I won't even attempt to repeat what he, what he was saying but he was just rapping the same rap over and over. And it was just some wild shit. And then when he performed that night, he did his set. And then he did that rap. He spit that shit, the, the, the thing that he was going over in the, um, in the van. So that, that was one of my, my uh, fondest memories of, of Sean Price, man. So I just wanted to share that as well. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, dude, that dude was special, man. We lost, like, we lost a special one, man. All right, so let's let's get to your music, man. Um, I want to talk about, um, you know, uh, one of your uh, what's the what the name of the song? My my truth. Is that the yeah. okay? You had a uh, you had an interesting line in there about finding a baby in a ziploc. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the you know one of the perks of living in New York <laughs> back in, in the late eighties, early nineties. You know, you, you were liable to see anything, and That's so at the time. You know, there was a, it was it was it was a thing for a lot of these young females out there to, um, you know, abort their babies themselves, and you know, throw it in the trash and stuff like that. So that was a common thing, you know, finding babies in the trash, and you know, uh, that was that was one day for me. You know, it happened numerous times, but that was one day where you know. You walking down the block, and, and we, we headed towards the park. I got my ball in my hand. You walking past the rats. You know the rats are running over your feet, and then boom! I run. There's, there's a ziploc bag on the floor. What, what's inside of the shit? What is that? That's a that's a, a fetus. That's a baby fetus. One of these dirty rats out here took that shit out from inside of her and put it in a bag and threw it on the floor. Wow, you know? that's that's crazy. So, yeah. That that whole song was just. I mean, I'm I'm happy I wrote that. It wasn't planned. I wrote it on the spot in about an hour. And uh, my man Sag, uh, you know, he's home now and shit. But he was just going to do a bid, and he was leaving the next day. So this was the day before we all in the lab. There was a lot of emotion, you know what I'm saying? Because we don't want to, you know, you don't want to see your homie go away to do a bid. And she was going away for three three years. Not a long time when you think about it, but, you know, it's a long time when, you know, this is your people. You see you with them every day. And um, so, you know, there was the, there was just a somber mood in the lab that day. And um, I actually, I, I was able to get that off my chest, I think, because of that situation. You know, like if, if, if SAG, if SAG, if SAG would have never got locked up, my truth probably would have never came out or been created. That's a pretty heavy song too, though, man. You you put a lot into that song. Yeah, yeah. For what I mean, I couldn't even listen to this shit after I recorded it. I listened to it that day, of course, because we had to, you know, keep going over and then and saying, should we fix this or should we fix that? But once it was done, I couldn't really listen to it for maybe close to a year. Yeah, because you got to hear those things again. 
it, it brought back a lot. You know, I, I couldn't. You know, sometimes you just shit in, in this in this world that you know sometimes yeah just make your eyes well up with tears, man. And you know, as men, you know. We Latinos, man. You, you got that machismo shit about mm-hmm. you. I got too much pride, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't want to hear that pride. shit. Yeah, I don't want to hear that shit. Yeah. I, I understand, man. Yeah, because you, you talked a lot about a lot of personal things, you know what I'm saying? And um, that's, uh, that's, that's art, man. You know what I'm saying? Getting that stuff out of your heart, you know what I'm saying? Out of your mind and, and, and releasing it. But sometimes you don't want to hear it. I don't even want to hear this shit when I play it back. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I don't, I don't even want to hear my own voice. You know what I'm saying? But... uh. But yeah. you got to, you know, sometimes you got to, and, um, but, uh, like I said, man, um, what else do we want to talk about? I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, that interview you did, man. You met, you mentioned something about the state of hip hop, uh, that it doesn't want to see any, it, the corporate hip hop doesn't want to see an African American CEO. It's not, not necessarily, uh. African American, but let's say from the, the, the streets, you know, uh, somebody yeah. coming from the ground up, uh, that type yeah. of that that Jay Z, the somebody that they didn't place there, somebody that forced their way through the door. Yeah, the I thought that was the cities, the hoes. I thought that was a great great uh, perspective, and I never thought about it like that, you know. And I do a lot of analyzing in it, uh, of the game, but I never uh, I've never looked at it that way. I look past that. So um, I I'd just like for you to kind of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we were all I think looking for answers once you saw the shift in the um the quality of the music. You know, what was being spoken about um the production, everything just kind of became really uh what's the word I'm looking for? Uh everything became kindergarten like like I mean, it was like it, it was it was it wasn't evolving it like it's real evolved. simple real, real simple yeah. minded type yeah it was yeah very very mid doctor seuss <laughs> i like to use doctor seuss as the uh you know an example because those books but um it became and i think that that all happened for a reason i think that hip hop was becoming so powerful and creating so many you know uh uh important people that were moving the culture and moving the people along forward and and sending a message you know that um that had to be destroyed you know at least on the mainstream level because you know you're never going to get rid of the underground and we're always going to talk or we you know what we talk but if you get enough enough if you can get enough people to agree that you know the kind of music that us underground dudes are making is 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 corny. You know, you take the listener away, especially the youth, which is the most important because these are the you know the ones that are gonna grow to you know that this the next generation. They're gonna take over. They're gonna become you know bosses and, and CEOs. But they took the youth away from us. From from they they there was a gap, you know, mm-hmm. and um. I don't know if that gap could ever be bridged again because it's, it, it's so it's so wide. Yeah, I agree. You know, these young kids don't want to hear that. There's a few out there who uh, who follow suit. You know, my man Joey, Joey Badass. Um, you know, even Dave. I like Dave. Kendrick is very political yeah. to me. Um, Cole speaks on a lot of life issues, not so much politics, but things that I think are of, an, of importance that people need to hear. Um, but for the most part, you know, the, the, the trap took over. And I think, is you know, you start to see too many power players. Like I said, the Diddy's, the Birdman's, the um, the Hoves, the Steve Stouts, you and know, these guys. It's, the it's, it's funny to see, like, who who they put in, uh, who, the, who the faces are, who the money goes to, you know, because, you know, growing up, you know, you... You gravitate towards the dollar, right? You you look up to the person. I mean, for the most part, everybody has their own thing, but you look at the people that have the money and the power, and you're like, that's that's what I want to be like. So when you see it now, and when the kids are seeing it now, it's a lot of buffoonery. It's no substance, you know what I'm saying? And um, 
and and that's why I, that's why that that statement that you made made so much sense because it's kind of like we can prop up this image while and kind of like throw you off your course and still control this thing because they were losing control you know people uh, were so quick to call us haters for having that you know looking at it from that perspective but i don't think this culture ever was created for the you know just to have fun mm -hmm. there was a message there was a message behind it there was you know the ability to get things off of your chest to alleviate the stress of, of of our people who you know come up in the hood and um to me it's just kind of ironic when it's been twisted in such a way that you have these young kids now rapping about all of these expensive things that they can't even afford really i mean you talking about Prada belts and, and, and Gucci shoes and all this mm -hmm. shit. Yeah, you might buy it, but you're going back home to the projects at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, when the priorities should be the other way around, you should be looking to, you know, move up the bigger and better, get out of the hood. And then, you know, if you got it like that, go and get your little Gucci belts or whatever. But, you know, this is this is the part they used our strongest weapon against us. And it's, it's tough to fight back. When they take what you used to own and just they use it against you, you know. Now, how do you recreate that? How do you recreate the power that that weapon used to have? It's hard when all, there's so much money involved and so many people are comfortable. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's hard to to have somebody change or convince somebody to change what they're doing when there's so much money involved in nonsense. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some. I mean, I'm not gonna knock. I'll, I'll never knock anybody for for uh, for even the music. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I I take a lot of pride in um in the quality of a sound. You know, especially when it comes to hip hop or rap music. But um, it's it's just there's so much money involved. Like how could you convince otherwise? How can you convince somebody to do otherwise? It's gonna have to take one of these these people to, like. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and the the good thing I, that I that I do respect, as you as you mentioned, you know, the Cole and the Kendrick and things like that, is that these guys are at the pinnacle of the um of the of the rap game. You know what I'm saying? Like when you know coming up for us, you know, we have the pinnacle for us. And I and I'll just speak in the '90s, in the early 2000s. You got you know uh, Big and and Ho and things like that. Um, these were like the 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 and Nas. How can I forget Nas? You know what I'm saying? Um, so these were the top artists back then, and, and then now we have these guys are the top artists. So we might have, you know, your your uh, your trap sounds, but a lot of it's always going to be the new guy come around to replace that older guy. But that sound hasn't left in the past 15 years, you know, or so. Um, but the guys at the top, they 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 have a message, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and I think that's the best it can get right now. I don't think it's ever going to turn back to that but thank god for the internet you know the pro and, uh the pro and confident internet is that uh yeah. we can we can reach out to artists like you and listen to artists like you who who um these major labels may not want to sign because oh you don't fit the description of what uh, of what we're looking for so as as consumers we're able to pick and choose what we want but it but as us growing up the impact of what uh mainstream media or whatever you want to call it the you know listen watching rap cities or uh, young tv raps and things like that uh the video music box um we were always given the raw you know what i'm saying we saw we saw we saw all the spectrums of it right now you know what i'm saying but it's it seems to be all the light is is shined in one direction and it's like yeah. eh, you know but. yeah i never i never want to be that guy to say well you know i don't like this music I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a super issue with with trap music. I really don't. I, I actually like some of it. Ironically, yeah. People think that I hate it, but I do. I have my ratchet moments, you know. We all have our, our guilty pleasure. Yeah. But um, it just can't be one thing. When you turn mainstream hip hop into one thing, you just, you know, you, you, like I said before, you took the power, you, you took the message. There has to be a balance in this culture. That's why I'm, I'm glad that those guys are at the top, those young guys like the Coles and the Kendricks, 
because there was no machine that put those guys in in their, in their position. The people put them there. Yeah, you know, they and wanted to hear that. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. You know what I'm saying? The, the consumer, the people are gonna be like, I either like it or I don't. Even though they they got tricks to they they I believe you know they got these psychologists you know that that know what to put out there you know to constantly beat it in your head you know just like uh craft cheese or whatever the case may be they keep playing it in the commercial you know what I'm saying you're gonna be like you know what I think I want to go get me some craft cheese you know what I'm saying knowing you probably shouldn't eat that shit you know what I'm saying I don't, but I don't think corporate America is too happy that you have the Coles and the Kendricks at the pinnacle of the culture because they know those guys could be game changers yeah and they're not responsible for placing them there which says a lot about you know a, 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 a large demographic of the fans too which makes me very happy to know that you know there's a lot of people out there that do support that but um i think you know it changed i'm a, i'm a big fan of dead prayers yeah me too let's get free was one of the best albums i ever heard in my life absolutely from, from production to raps i never heard somebody a group besides public enemy make uh political references sound so street you know like you, you for for a minute you forget what you're listening to because this just sounds like some dope street music mm -hmm. and then you know you start paying attention to the lyrics and you're like damn there's a lot of jewels here oh man and i think yeah. that i feel like that album changed things like it really really changed things like that's when that's when corporate said all right we're shutting the door on this now we really because we cannot have another album like let's get free yeah they even banned the cover they they had they made them change the cover to the album and um I, they probably didn't want it out there you know what i'm saying but shout out to lord jamar because he put them didn't he put them dudes on yeah he produced a lot of the album yeah, he put yeah. them on there hasn't been another politically fueled album like that mm -hmm. since you know you had a song here a song there like with the kendricks like i was talking about but you haven't had anything like that. There hasn't been another Public Enemy, another X Clan, you know, another Dead Prayers. Uh, you had that group from from I think the West Coast called the Coop. The Coop, yeah. You know, very politically, uh, you know, fueled. Most Def, who for some reason, you know, went silent, all then started focusing on the acting. Yeah. You know, I don't put it past, you know, these these corporate entities to threaten these guys and then make them stop doing what they're doing yeah when there's a lot of money involved man it's that it's, there's a lot of power around there you know and it's and I, you know a regular person like me will be surprised you know what what is actually being said behind closed doors or or actions that are actually being taken i mean what what forces a man to move out this country and and and, and not want to come back, you know what I'm saying? Most, I'm talking about most depth, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and even be held captive in Guantanamo Bay, for, you know, like that's what I'm saying. Like, what was he talking? What was he saying? You know, what was he talking about? You know, and and what didn't they want him to say? What what didn't they want him to 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 put out there? And you know, the proof is in the pudding. All you gotta do is check for the ingredients. You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, it's it, there's definitely a power in uh in the music and like you said, it's not all it wasn't all about the party, even though that a lot of it started that way. It was just about the streets and the perspective and um and the struggle and overcoming that struggle. But I think that that almighty dollar, man, you know, you give money to people that never had money, and then once they got that money, they don't want to lose the money, you know. Yeah. And um, but then you got people that do want to fight back, and I would I would. I would probably would classify most deaf in, in that uh you know in that category because why would why would he not be able to come back? You know what I'm saying? Why would it be such a hard time? Why would they keep him in Guantanamo Bay? Why would he be held captive in uh in in Africa? You know, because he was even in Africa. They he he uh they wouldn't grant his passport to travel to other countries in Africa. I don't know wh exactly which country he was in, but I know he wasn't allowed to go to other places. Yeah, man. All of that intertwines, man. You know the political stuff, the um, you know the money, like you said, is is it's not a coincidence that hip hop is the the was the biggest bootlegged music in the in the world. You didn't see country music being bootlegged. You didn't. I mean, they were selling millions. You had opera albums that were selling millions. You didn't see opera albums, you know, 
laying on a carpet somewhere on the avenue selling for five dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, they they took the money out of the artist's hands because you know with that with the the you know, beginning of bootlegging and downloading illegal downloading, mm-hmm. and that spiraled out of control. That took, you know that that hurt record sales. Now people don't buy records anymore, and that's I don't think that that was you know by coincidence. I think that was perfectly planned. Now you have streaming, which is even worse. Yeah. And now people don't want to download, so they stream. And the, st- the money that you get that an artist gets for streaming is, I mean, ridiculous. Yeah, Peanuts. yeah. You got to do like millions to get like 10 bucks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's crazy. So now, you know, they have to find a way to, the artists have to fight and try to find a way to, you know, change the way they, they, they're getting their money off of streaming. Because, that, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Somebody gets if your album gets streamed a million times, and you get a couple of thousand dollars, there's something is seriously wrong. Here. And it's funny, it's like you know, you mentioned that it's like the the beautiful thing about it is that people find a way to overcome. You want to stop selling CDs? Well, we're gonna do these. We're gonna do these downloads. Oh, you want to stop the downloads? All right, we'll do these streams. You want to stop these streams? We're gonna figure something else out. So I I think. Uh, I don't think I don't think anybody can stop this thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, we just gotta keep people like you making music. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and keeping that, and keeping your voice out there. And I'm so glad you were able to do this because, like, you got a lot of good shit to say, man, and um, a lot of uh, insight that I didn't look at it like that. I didn't even look at it like that the way you're talking about the, the streaming process. I never I never realized that it was just hip hop music that was being bootlegged. But if I think back on it, that's all that I remember being bootlegged. You know what I'm saying? Was bootleg tapes going back to bootleg tapes, at, bootleg CDs? If you, the, if you if you look back at it, the power for the artist, the power lied in the, the record sales. Mm-hmm. If you sold records, you had leverage to cut new deals and restructure your deals with these these major companies. They didn't want to give out those big money deals. I mean, mm-hmm. back in the day, as much as as dudes was getting raped on their deals, they were still giving out big money. Yeah, so there's yeah. guys that there's guys that signed with labels for you know half a million dollars, and then the label let them go, and they walked with the half a million, and even had to pay it back. And they get to take their masters. That's unheard of these days. So now, if they take away your ability to sell records, they take away your ability to re- to negotiate. So now the ball's in their court. So now you have you know almost every artist out there signed to a 360 deal, mm-hmm. which they weren't being signed to back in the you know the 90s. Late 80s, uh, 90s, they were just getting, they were getting raped on their deals, but it wasn't 360s. 360s, you know, these, which basically means that any kind of money you're making off of your music, whether it's merch, uh, record sales, shows, even sometimes features, the labels eating off of that. Endorsements. Yeah. So now you had, you know, you're a new artist, you got a big buzz, but you're not gonna sell records because records don't sell anymore. But you could go on tour, and mm-hmm. it could be very lucrative. So they sign you to a 360, to you know, to one of these majors sign you, and they're gonna eat off of you for as long as they can before they put your album out. Because once they put your album out, you're not under contract anymore. Mm-hmm. So they'll delay your album even being released for two or three years. As long as you stay hot in the streets because you can do all these shows and, and do all these features and sell all this merch and they can eat off of you like that. That's interesting. And then once you go yeah, once you go cold, they kick you to the curb and that's it, your career is over. You know? Wow. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that. Uh all right, so let's talk a little bit about um before we wrap up, I wanna talk about Sip the Nectar, man. Um uh you said it took about three years for you to get done, right? Yeah. Should, I mean, <clears throat> I would say that the actual work took three years. Yeah. But not, should, I, I would say I would say that the album took when it come out last year. The album took thirty eight years to come out. Yeah, yeah. It's your first baby, right? Yeah, thirty eight years to come out and three years of actual work. And you know, it, it was done a few times, and I had to scrap the whole thing and start over a couple times. But we got it done, man. So how did, how did you feel about, um, cause I know, cause I've been one of those people that would hit you up and be like, yo, when are you going to drop your album? Before the album came out, I'm like, when are you going to drop your album? I know a lot of people did that to you as well, you know, on Twitter yeah, and things like yeah. that. So did that ever get tiresome to you or like, yo, y'all, y'all just wait, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have it. 
I'm not gonna lie, man. I I, I was I was very annoyed at, at at one point, but I had to understand that you know, because I've been and I still am in in the fans' seat. I sit in the seat of a fan as well. I'm waiting for albums to come out. Mm-hmm. I was bugging, you know, Rock Marcy's manager last night, asking, "Yo, when's the next Rock Marcy album dropping?" But um, oh by the way, which is Rock Marcy's album will be out in a week. Oh, okay. So, so you got so we got a scoop. We got a scoop. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, I I wanted to send everything towards the label. Like, yo, ask the label. Like, direct everything towards them. Don't ask me, because you know I've got a few dates that you know they didn't. We we didn't we wound up not making that you know those dates, so I had like three or four different release dates until we finally got it out. So it was frustrating, but you know, like I said, everything happens for a reason, man. You just gotta buckle down and um, you know, appreciate what it does. I I don't think that it would have done any better or or any less had it come out two or three months earlier or two or three months after. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the same body of work and the same people listening, and I was just happy to get it out. So what's the um? So are you still uh, signed with um, Man Bites Dog as far as a, a project, or was it like a one project deal with them? Yeah, that 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 was a one off. Um, okay. You know, now with this next album, I think you know, we're gonna give them you know the first crack at it, mm-hmm. but you know. With you know we're not signed, so we were open to listen. You know we're open to listening to to other offers, but um, you know first and foremost, you know I gotta thank Man by His Dog for you know just uh, teaming up and helping the way that they helped with the project. So before we speak to anybody, we're gonna go back to the table with them. Yeah. And um, you know there's even a chance that if things don't work out and we don't put it out through them that. You know, me and my team will wind up doing it ourselves yeah. under our own imprint. So what was the, um, what was some of their, their role and responsibility as being a label for, uh, for getting your project out? They were pretty much just the, uh, you know, the guys who, who organized, you know, we were all over the place with it, you know, song here, song there, producer over here, we can't contact. This dude, you know, because like I said, the album took three years to put together. So, you know, there were there were songs that I recorded three years before the album dropped, and maybe I wasn't in constant contact with that producer anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe they thought that song was never gonna be recorded and gave the beat out to somebody else. So, so all the legalities of, and things like that. It, it was a lot of loose ends to be, you know tied up and I think that they you know the label helped a whole lot with um, just organizing everything and so so know, it gives you the sure. opportunity to just be the artist and let them handle all that all that extra shit yeah. right yeah okay that makes sense alright man well uh, let's wrap this up man I, I appreciate all the time and all the jewels you dropped today man um, like I said I've always wanted to have this conversation man I feel like there's a lot of stuff I didn't cover here, but, you know, we can try doing this again down the line. We can definitely uh, do it again, man. Cause Even I got, before this album drops. I, I, I love speaking. I love being able to have a platform to speak and just, you know, just you chop it up like a personal convo, like, you know, just me and you right here. That, and that's what I wanted this to be, you know. I, didn't, I, I know there's a lot of Q&A because I, I just had questions in general, but um, yeah. just the just – the, the life perspectives and things like that. That's the type, that's what I wanted to get out of a conversation. That's what I want to get with these podcasts. But, um, but coroner, man, let them know, uh, you know, shout outs, um, contact info, whatever you want to, uh, let the people know, man, just let them know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, y'all can reach me on my social media at AG the coroner. Um, you know, that's on Twitter. That's on Instagram is AG D A C O R O N E R. And, um, you know, I just, I'd like to shout out everybody, man, the entire universe, everybody who, who who listened to the project, everybody who didn't listen to the project. You know, everybody, man. You know, this is, every everything is a part of everything. So, Sip the Nectar, I feel was a, a success for um, you know, for my scale, the 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 scale that I set, the bar that I set for myself, and um, we're gonna do a lot bigger and a lot better with the second album coming. You know, the Revenant. 
that should be out, you know, by the top of the summer. Um, been working on, you know, projects with, uh, you know, my homies, the Narcotechs. Y'all might have seen the video we put yeah, out yeah, with Tony yeah. Touch, kicking the, kicking, kicking La Puerta. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a lot more work. You know, I'm like an unofficial member of the Narcotechs. Right. Um, their music is incredible, so I can't wait to, you know, get to these projects with them. But I'm definitely looking forward to the Revenant, man. Like, there's, there's, you know, like if you like, if you, if, if you was a, a fan of Sip the Nectar, I think the Revenant is gonna be ten times better than what Sip the Nectar was. And I'd like to add that um, if you follow him on on Instagram or or Facebook, whatever, or Twitter, just prepare, be prepared for a lot of funny ass memes, uh, yeah. a lot of commentary. You know what I'm saying? But if you want to go hear the music, YouTube that name because there's a lot of music on there to uh, to listen to. Uh, unless, yeah, yeah. unless you got another uh, links for your music. But do the history all do the history all the way back, all the way back to the outdoorsman days, the early mm-hmm. days with me, Jay, Action, and, and and May. A lot of stuff from back then is still on the net, still available for people to listen to, all the way up until now. I did a million features, you know, already with, a, I mean, a ton of artists. And like I said, we got so much more to come. And like and like the homie said, if you want to have a good laugh, go to my IG. I just posted a little while ago, a little girl dancing to some crazy song. This shit is hysterical. I was crying. <laughs> and, uh, you know, music, you know, laugh, laughing is great for the soul, man. So. Oh, and one last thing. You said uh, you said that you did have a song with, uh, with Sean Price recorded, but you haven't released it yet. Um, yeah. Is that a personal choice or is that, um, you know, Legalities that you might not be, that you don't, that you're not ready to deal with. I mean, I, I had I had a conversation with his wife, you know, great friend of mine, beautiful sister Bernadette. You know, we love you. Um, she was putting together a project for Sean, and he wanted to make sure that you know everybody who had verses from Sean reached out. And I don't I don't really think I was ever on that list for her. Like she knew what he did for me, and you know the kind of relationship that we had. But out of respect, anyway, I had to, you know, let her know what was going on. And, you know, she gave me the green light. Okay. Just do what you do. You know, Sean would have wanted it like that. So it's a joint with me, him, and Illogy. Okay. And, um, you know, God willing, I think I'm going to put this one on, on the Revenant. I didn't put it out on Sip the Nectar because I, it was just still too fresh, you know, losing him like that. And I didn't want to feel, even if it because, of course, that wasn't the intention. I would never try to take advantage or, or you know, of a situation. And, but, um, you know, for marketing purposes. Yeah. And I think that I'm past that now. You know, I've, I've been, I've, I've had enough, sufficient enough time to mourn and um, ready to move forward and, and put that out for the people to listen to. A lot of people put out music as soon as he passed that had him on it, and it was very tasteless. You know? So... No, not everybody's not everybody's a man of integrity, you know. I I know I know it all wasn't done with bad intentions. Some people that was their way of dealing with it, their therapy, and maybe they wanted to get his voice heard out there, you know, ASAP, to feel connected to him. But at the same time, you know, there was a lot a lot of people that weren't about that. I didn't I didn't even want to be part of none of that. So. That's not how you roll, man. All yeah. right, man. Well, thank you once again, man. Thank you for coming on the Eastside Morales podcast. Um, I will be in touch with you once we we get this done and uh, and dropped. And um, you know, best of luck to you. And I'm definitely still gonna be in touch via uh, social media. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, man. Thank you, thank you for having me, man. I'm honored to do this. Uh, I can't wait to do it again. I, I would do it four or five days a week if I could, brother. <laughs> All right, no doubt. Let's definitely do it again before the uh, before the next album drops and after the next album drops. And uh, shit, you know, always enjoy having having you on the social media, bro. All right, brother. Will always, you take always love. All right, man. Will you take care of yourself? You too, bro. All right, peace. Peace. <laughs>